You've got the peace to understand that even though we are living through a crushing season as a planet with global warming and everything else going on and people shooting and people fighting on planes and all kinds of sickness and people dying on respirators. You've got to know in the midst of all of this that God is not taken by surprise that he chose us to go through this. And he wouldn't have chosen us to go through this if we didn't have what it takes to go through this. I know what it's like to be poor. And I know what it's like to be without. And I know what it's like not to have dinner for my kids. Returning to that, that the idea that that could happen is terrifying. And the enemy always has some sort of tool or memory or situation that he uses to terrify you, even though the, the good times are here and, and, and the dream is there and the blessing is there and the goodness is there. But there's always this haunting, nagging defiance that says, don't you relax. You're not worth it. You don't deserve it and it's not going to last. Resting in what God has done is often more difficult than receiving what God has done. To rest in it, to believe that it will last, to believe that you will last, that love will last, that, that, that life will last, that, that good times will come, that things will be better, is difficult because of the voices and you are what you eat, and the voices are the food that feeds your faith or fear. So if you want to change your diet, you can change your outcome. But you have to stop talking to yourself the way you do. Because if you continue to talk to yourself the way you do, you will always be where you've always been. It is what you say within yourself that heals you. The woman with the issue of blood said to herself, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. There was no scripture to validate that. She couldn't say, she wasn't quoting Deuteronomy or new numbers or anything like that. It's just something she said to herself. There was no doctrine around it. We've never seen that happen before. But she said to herself, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. And all the while she was crawling, she kept saying over and over again, if I can just touch, if I can just touch, if I can just touch, if I can just touch the hem of the garment. And without Jesus' permission, and without the support of the disciples, she creeped up on him and snatched a miracle. Snatched it. Snatched it because of what she said to herself. You see those voices that say what you can't do, what you can't have, what you can't be, what's not going to last, what's not going to work, is how the enemy pulverizes the promises of God in your life. And it takes word to combat word. That's why when Jesus was in the wilderness and Satan was throwing word at him, he was throwing word back. And what we have to do is put word on word. I'm blessed. I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed in my uprising. I'm blessed in my downsetting. I'll be blessed into my old age. I'll be blessed when I'm an old man. My grandchildren will be blessed. My body is blessed. My body is, my mind is blessed. My head is blessed. I got this. I can handle it. I can do it. Bring it on. Here it is. That kind of talk, saying that to yourself, drives back the other voices of negativity that we all have creep up behind us and tell us that we're not capable and we're not competent and we're not gifted enough and we're not good enough or we waited too late or God is punishing us. To talk back to those voices shuts the enemy down. The pressure I was going through, I was causing because the pressure I was going through was coming from the things that I allowed to reverberate in my head. And I'm wondering if there are things echoing in your head right now that are stopping you from living your best life because you will not silence them by speaking back. 
you shall have whatever you say. So says the word of God. You shall have whatever you say. If it's betrayal, you shall have whatever you say. If it's a life without love, you shall have whatever you say. It doesn't just work positively, it also works negatively. You shall have whatever you say. She touched him and she was made whole. And he says, who touched me? Which means he's oblivious to what's going on. This is all happening in her head. The whole thing happened in her head and the Lord who is omniscient asked a question, who touched me? And the disciples wanting to be important answered him, said, everybody touched you. He said, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm talking about. Everybody around me don't touch me. Everybody around me don't touch me. You've been said. Everybody around me don't touch me. Just because you're around me don't mean you touch me. Somebody touch me. Somebody touch me. And she came out from the crowd sheepishly and said, it was me. When I say excellent, you say excellent. 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 The problem is, we all said the same word, but we don't all mean the same thing. Because what you call excellent, what I call excellent, may be two different things based on the lives we've lived, the things we've experienced, the places we've been exposed to. Our ideas of excellent may vary drastically based on how we define excellence. The problem with the English language is that it is limited to interpretation. So how do you know when I say I love you that I mean what you meant when you said you love me? So we're having a conversation and I'm making an assumption that your love is my love and it may not be at all. Or we're planning a banquet and I, and I make an assumption that your excellent is my excellent and it may not be at all. Because the reality about it is your definition of excellent rises no higher than your level of exposure. Whatever you've been exposed to, that becomes the new paradigm of what excellent is to you. And it shifts from day to day. And the hardest thing in the world is to have a conversation with somebody and all you have to use is words. Because I'm not sure that you mean what I mean when I say excellent. I'm not sure that you mean what I mean when I say love. I'm not sure you mean what I mean when I say loyal. I'm not sure you mean what I mean when I say hurt. Because all we have is words. The reality is we have to make up in our mind that whatever our definition of excellence is, it's gonna change. <laughs> it's gonna get higher, it's gonna get broader, it's gonna get better, it's gonna be different, or it's gonna go down. And a lot of it depends on who you hang around and what you're exposed to. There are people that take you up, there are people that bring you down, they bring you down to their level of excellence. That's what, that's what a job description for a hater looks like. The job description of the hater is to bring you down to the level that they are on. So that while they're trying to pull you down, I'm trying to get up. And if I'm going to get up, I have to know that there's gonna be a cost in getting up. I'm gonna have to put my back to it or it's not gonna happen. God wants somebody to work with him and give what it takes to make it happen. Is it worth it? Absolutely. I do not want to die. Let me explain. I, I, I was born in between two dead babies. The baby before me died, the baby after me died. I was raised by a dying father. And I do not want to live my life and die. And at the last moment of my life, ask this question, wonder what would have happened if I'd have pushed a little harder. I don't wanna, I don't wanna get down to the end of the road and, and wonder what would have happened if I'd have pushed 
a little harder. I don't want to wander there. I want to get down to the end of the road like Paul and say, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. I finished my course. And now later for me is a crown of righteousness in the heaven. I don't want to get down to my last breath and wonder what would have happened if I went back to school, if I took a course, if I worked a little harder, if I changed the way I dress, if I changed the way I talked to people, if I forgave somebody, if I released somebody. I don't want to wonder about nothing. Because that is excellence. Excellence is to come out with the conclusion, I have no regrets. The dying words of the thief on the cross was remember me. The words of Jesus at the Last Supper is as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. What does remember mean? Remember, re, put back together again. Remember me. When we remember what God has done, that becomes the foundation on which we build our lives. Now a house is not a foundation and nobody can live in a foundation, but it has to have a foundation in order to be a house. And I'm not suggesting that your life begins, ends, and all through the middle is nothing but Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Because you gotta take out the trash, you gotta brush your teeth, you gotta comb your hair, you gotta get your nails done, you gotta get your feet done, or you're gonna cut your blankets when you're laying in the bed at night. All of that happens. But I am saying that God is the foundation. When God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, he did it as a foundation for them to remember. And all through the Old Testament, he says over and over again, am I not the God who brought you out from the Red Sea? Am I not the God who brought you out by my own hand and my strong arm? It becomes a point of reference to which you face the future, remembering what he did in the past, remembering it, putting it back together again, again, and again, and recreating it as a point of reference to fight from, to stand from, to drive from, to, to preach from, to teach from. What do you have to remember? It's important that you have something to remember, something on God's resume that you know that you know that you know that he did for you. And it tells you that if God would do that, he can do this. If he can drive back the Red Sea and bring me across on dry land, then he can fight you off. He can deal with the Amalekites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Gerashites. God does certain things so you will have something to remember, a point of reference to which you build your life upon and you stand on it and you say, I'm not sure about this and I'm not sure about that, but this one thing I do know. You have to know this. You have to know this in your knower. You have to know this when your girlfriend doesn't know it. When your prayer warriors don't know it, when your children don't know it, when your mama doesn't know it. Something that you know that you know that you know becomes the catalyst against the trials, against the traumas, against the sleepless nights, against the virus, against the crisis, against the times that we're living in. We have been living in the most perilous times that we have seen in a hundred years. We are living in a time where nearly 700,000 people are now dead from a, something we can't even see. We are fighting an invisible enemy and that enemy has friends that has created trauma and distress until we are overwhelmed even when nothing else is going wrong. Just the feeling that other people are going wrong gives us a certain degree of stress and trauma. We, how do we stand up against this unseen foe we fight right now? Of course we need to do everything we can to protect ourselves from the virus. But I'm not just talking about the virus, I'm talking about your mind. I'm talking about your emotions, your will, your spirit, your fight, your drive, your tenacity, your sense of normalcy, your courage to get out of the house, your courage to get out of the bed, the courage to continue when there's a threat requires that there's something about God that you have to remember. For the children of Israel, it was the blood of the lamb that was painted on the doorposts. And death angel passed by and said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. 
It was walking out to the Red Sea and hearing 600 chosen chariots coming with Pharaoh chasing them down, saying, I'm going to get you back. He was going to get them back, but let me tell you a secret. He was also trying to get back the wealth they'd taken. For the wealth of the unjust had been laid up for the just. And they had borrowed all the gold and all the silver and they had broken the GDP of Egypt. It wasn't just the slaves he wanted. He wanted the money back. He wanted the jewels. He wanted the gold. He wanted the silver. He wanted the things that the tabernacle would actually end up being built by. He was trying to get it all back. He could have got some more slaves anywhere. He was trying to get what they had borrowed. They had borrowed the whole economy of Egypt was running through the Red Sea. For the wealth of the unjust is laid up for the just. And when God brings you out, he brings out enough for your children. The Bible says that God put so much wealth on them that their children had to carry on their backs the wealth that God placed on them. I want the kind of blessing that affects my children and my children's children and my children's children's children. I I, I want my grandchildren to blow kisses at my picture when I'm dead and gone. I want them to be able to say, if it hadn't been for that old man, I'd have never been able to go to college. I'd have never been able to get a job. I'd have never been able to work for Google. I'd have never been able to work for Xerox. I'd have never been able to preach the gospel. I would have never been able to do it. I want that for them. So I have to have something to remember that I can count on that won't break. And I want to ask you, what do you remember when life gets hard, when things get tough? We as a generation are chosen to go through a challenge that this country or the world has not seen in a hundred years. Of all the generations, my mother missed it, my father missed it, my grandmother missed it, my great-grandmother missed it, They had trials, they had tests, they didn't have COVID. They didn't have masks all over their face. They didn't have people arguing and fighting about this, that, and the other. They didn't have George Floyd. They didn't have racial combat like it is right now. It's crazy. It's crazy, it's so crazy that there is enough stress in the world to take your sleep. And then when you add to it the stress of your own life, what's going on with you and the people in your house and the people you're related to and the people you love, and you take that stress and you put it on national stress, and then you add global stress, it's too much stress. Too much stress coming at us from all directions leaves us with unsuppressed trauma. Suppressed trauma, trauma that has no way to escape, that comes out in rage and self-medication and, and, and overindulgences and excesses and, and tempers and, and flaring and people, people jumping on stewardess and flight attendants and road rage and shooting people over parking spaces. That's too much stress. I've got good news. Jesus said, my peace give I unto thee. Not the peace of the world, but the peace which passeth all understanding. This is the peace that you stand under. (laughs) You heard me. Yeah. This is the peace that you stand under. You stand under a peace that defies logic. Crazy peace. Ridiculous peace. The kind of peace that other people will call you a fool for. But you just got a peace in your spirit and in your heart that he that has began a good work and you shall perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. You've got the peace to understand that even though we are living through a crushing season as a planet with global warming and everything else going on and people shooting and people fighting on planes and all kinds of sickness and people dying on respirators. You've got to know in the midst of all of this that God is not taken by surprise. That he chose us to go through this. And he wouldn't have chosen us to go through this if we didn't have what it takes to go through this. 
you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and I have chosen what to try you with and I have chosen what to crush you with. And if I thought you couldn't take it, I wouldn't expose you to it. I put you in the middle of it for you to stand up to it. And so today, it is very important that as we embrace our faith, we do it with a new tenacity. We do it with a new tenacity because we have an enemy that is ubiquitous, absolutely everywhere, and yet invisible, absolutely intangible, and we can't touch him anywhere. We can't see him, and we don't know who's next. But we have to know in whom we have believed and that he that has began a good work in us shall perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And we have to know the difference between being crushed by the Lord and being crushed by life. I will not let life crush me. God, you can do whatever you want. You can take me through whatever you will. Order my steps in your word, dear Lord. I am chosen for this generation. I was called to preach during a global pandemic with people dying and getting sick and people in the hallways of hospitals and morgues backed up and funerals delayed for two weeks. I was called. I was chosen for such a time as this. That means that God has given me something that's stronger than the times I'm in. I read about leadership, corporate leadership, church leadership, spiritual leadership, family leadership, everything I can find about leadership because I am a leader. And the more proficient I am at being a leader, the more impactful my life becomes. Just because you're up front doesn't make you a leader if the cars aren't moving. Leaders are determined by how much you move something from one place to another. Are you quantifiable? You ought to have some metrics to which, not a title, it's not a title, it's a metric. You're a leader when we move, when we move. To the degree that you move me, that's the degree that you led me. And so I'm fascinated about leadership. I'm fascinated that God says to Abraham, before he puts him to sleep. He says, your descendants shall be in Egypt for 400 years, but afterwards they shall come out with great substance. And Abraham dies believing a promise that he never got to see. And God says, when he looks at the children of Israel and how they were being crushed in Egypt, the Bible says that God remembered his promise to Abraham. Gosh, that excites me. Because Abraham was dead. And if God kept his word to a dead man, then surely God will keep his word to a man that's alive. To a woman that's alive. Abraham went to sleep trusting God's character to honor his word. Now we have gone 430 years, which is 10 generations, almost 11, and Abraham has been dead, and God speaks to Moses, and God says to Moses, I want you to go down there and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. But before he tells him what he wants him to do, he describes to him who he is. I am the God of Abraham. Yeah. Isaac and Jacob, that's who I am. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I am the God of three of your ancestors that are dead. I am their God. And today I have become your God. So take off your shoes, sign of covenant. Take off your shoes for the ground you stand on is holy ground because this day I call you into covenant. How do you know it was covenant? Because he called his name twice, Moses, Moses. And whenever God calls your name twice, it's covenant. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Once has he spoken it, twice have I heard it. Power belongs to God. So whether he's saying Moses, Moses, or Abraham, Abraham, or verily, verily, I say to you, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. This is a bilateral covenant that God has made to Moses to get them out of Egypt. God to the day had a stopwatch of when they would go in and when they would get out. He knows exactly when it's going to be over. He told Abraham that his descendants would be there 400 years as slaves. The reason they were there 430 years is because the first 30 years they were not slaves because Joseph was alive. But then after Joseph died, a Pharaoh arose who did not regard Joseph or his God. And they began to afflict them. And the more they afflicted them, the more they grew. And all of a sudden, they have been in captivity 400 years. And Moses' mama gets pregnant on the 399th year and births a boy named Moses. And there's a hit list to destroy him. But God protected him, not because Moses was Moses, but because Moses had purpose. Yes. And all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord, who are the called according to his purpose. So when you know you got a purpose, no matter who set out a decree, they can't kill you. So when he could no longer be hidden, they brought him out. And near Pharaoh is raising in his house the very one he is trying to kill. And he does it. He raises Moses on Pharaoh's money. He educates Moses in Pharaoh's school. He diversifies Moses to the point that Moses is genetically connected to the Hebrews, but experientially connected to the Egyptians, which gave him the courage to be able to come back after he had been in Jethro's house for 40 years and face Pharaoh and speak his language. We got to see normal disappear right in front of our face. It is not normal to preach in an empty church. It is not normal to be afraid of somebody when they cough. It is not normal to be reluctant to shake a hand. And we have seen the memorial of normal, which leaves us without a compass to understand how do we get back and what do we get back to and what does normal look like in this current environment? And I hate to say this to you and it might really upset you, but once a grape's been crushed, you can never get the juice back in the grape. So from that moment forward, that traumatic experience of having the pulp shatter the skin lacerate and the juice emerge, it signifies that that grape will never be the same again. And I suggest to you, my brothers and sisters, that there will be no normal to go back to. There may be a new normal, but the normal that we grew up with will never be quite the same again. It has changed the way we eat. It has changed the way we shop. It has changed the way we travel. It has changed how we receive packages. It has changed the way we do business. It has changed every aspect of our life. It has changed the way we educate our children. It has changed the way we go to the mall or don't go. It has changed the way we get Christmas gifts or don't get them. It has changed everything. And that's what happens when you're making wine. It changes everything. All hopes of being a grape is gone if you're gonna be wine. If you're gonna be wine, you gotta be willing to give up being a grape. And the challenge for a lot of us, we have, we have a difficult time accepting change because we are so in love with what was that we're not willing to explore what is. 
And so there we are in a situation where God has allowed something to come and crush our normal and get us out of our normal. And all of a sudden we are afraid, never realizing that what's in front of you is always better than what's behind you. That it's better to be wine than to be grapes. When you are wine and not grapes, you don't have to worry about insects. You don't have to worry about weather conditions. You don't have to worry about locusts. You don't have to worry about disease. You don't have to worry about fungus. You don't have to worry about problems. That whenever God disrupts you, it's only because he's got something better for you. In the height of the disruption, he said something to me that I thought was very important. He said, when you pray for change, I always answer with disruption. Because you cannot have change without disruption. You can't have a baby without disruption. And whenever you ask for change, you've got to be prepared for disruption. If you plant an oak tree in the earth, it's going to disrupt the soil. If you plant a peach tree in the soil, it's going to disrupt the ground. There's no way you can have growth without disruption. But God said to me, when you say change, I send disruption, but don't let the disruption become a distraction. Because if you're not careful, you will try to solve the disruption as if that were the victory when that is not the victory at all. I did not call you to solve the disruption. I sent the disruption in answer to your request for change. Come on, go with me. We're going somewhere. I sent the disruption. So don't change goals and make it uh, a distraction. In other words, Nehemiah, you're doing a great work. Don't come down to Sam Ballad and Tobiah and make changing their mind your victory because changing their mind won't build your wall. So that disruption is a distraction. So the Lord says to me, and I'll say this in rap. He says, when you pray for change, I answer with disruption. The challenge of your faith is not to allow the disruption to become a distraction because in every disruption, there will always be an opportunity. So rather than wrestling with the disruption, look for the opportunity. And, And in the midst of this disruption, the people who are going forward are people who see opportunity where we see distraction. What do we need that we didn't need before? How do we serve that need in a way that we didn't serve before? How do we get out of the box in the way we think and how we function and how we deal with it? What should we take in school? What, how should we aim our children? What should we point them at? Seeing as the world has changed and every time you go into a grocery store and you check out your groceries yourself through those machines and you go and get a plane ticket and you go through it and just flash your phone over it and go on in, every machine standing there is a job that's gone. So don't fail to prepare for what's next because you're trying to get what was. What was? 